I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Directors, or Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that the meeting has been duly called, and the notice of the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time is 6 o'clock. I'd like to turn some time over for our invocation to uh, Dale Inman. If you feel so inclined, please pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings, the many divine blessings you've given our community, the blessings you've poured out in this great nation. We thank you for freedom, for liberty, and for prosperity. We thank you for a nation that works for people who are willing to work for the nation. And help us remain a nation, one nation, under God, as we continue to strive and look for areas to increase and ensure liberty and justice for all. Father, we ask the voices of those who would be silenced who would throw you out of our culture, not of our nation. We petition your blessings and your security on the students, the parents, the taxpayers, teachers, employees, and the administration of Conroe ISD. Father, give us wisdom as we seek to hear from the people and lead as you would have us lead. Father, I thank you so much for Dr. Noll and the administration he's put together here at Conroe ISD. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please join Ms. Stacy Chase as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor and honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Inman and Mr. Chase. Is that okay if I go? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Hubert. Um, just want to make one statement about the weather tonight. We had, um, I've been on two weather calls this evening, and it sounds like we're going to be in a situation to have some bad weather come in overnight, potentially in the morning. So um, for all our parents and staff here, just know that we will be on a call tomorrow morning at 4.30. Um, but it does look like it's a potential hazardous situation tomorrow. So we'll have to make a call about school tomorrow um, I know it's hard to think that it hasn't been raining all day, but both sets of meteorologists that we talked to have predicted uh, potentially eight to 10 inches uh, overnight and into tomorrow. So hopefully we will get through tonight and get you out of here before it starts this evening, but we'll be, uh, yeah. we'll be on the lookout for tomorrow to make sure we keep everybody safe. So just, we have sent an email to all parents and students this afternoon, as well as posted that on our social media. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noll. All right, moving on to item 2A, special board recognition. Uh, we'll do 2A and 2B together, special board recognition for some 2021 URL um, girls, class 6A girls high jump and 800 meter state champions. All right, thank you, Mr. Hubert. We had a, uh, a wonderful state track meet for Conroe ISD um, just a few, a few days ago. And here tonight to celebrate, uh, we're going to have some state champions recognized this evening. We're going to start with our state champions from the Woodlands High School. And to make those introductions will be our principal, Dr. Ted Landry. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noel, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to recognize our student athletes tonight. Um, these athletes, uh, they work so very hard. They put in, literally put in the miles and the time and the sacrifices. Uh, while all at the same time juggling their academics and do, they do a fantastic job and for them to to rise to the pinnacle of their event uh, is just something that is truly deserving so we, we really appreciate you taking the time to recognize them tonight uh, so if you will allow me I'd in, like to introduce uh, our boys and girls uh, track and field head coach coach Juris Green and he will introduce us to the athletes and the assistant coaches thank you Dr. Noel Board, thank you so much for having us here. And I have to say, it, it's been too long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I've, I've, a couple of things before I introduce these athletes. Um, last couple state meets in cross country, in 2019, our boys were second. And this past fall, our boys and girls were third. And I, I promise you, one of the first thoughts in my mind when we got the results was, this is not going to get us back to the board now. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this really is a big deal. I, I've said that many times. It's a big deal for me. And, uh, 
for our, our boys and girls to be recognized by you. Um, so thank you so much. And um, one final note is, is just a debt of gratitude to you all for your leadership this year. Uh, I, I know we are coming in, landing on fumes. I mean, look at me, I haven't shaven in weeks. What's wrong with me? Uh, but um, you, you have, you've inspired me, and I know there's countless other employees in this district who feel the same way. I've uh, just been so impressed with your leadership through a crazy year, I, I think. Uh, it, it goes without saying. So thank you so much um, for that. Um, a couple of athletes I would like to introduce, uh, Joshua English and Kennedy Dokes, if you wouldn't mind coming and standing up here, please. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go ladies first. Uh, Kennedy, um, I inherited being a first year girls uh, coach at the Woodlands High School. Um, bit of history about Kennedy. Her father is a product of McCullough High School and is also a state champion high jumper wow. uh, for nice. McCullough. Uh, and so she has uh, followed in his footsteps and maybe even one up them a little bit with a second medal in the triple jump. A <laughs> uh, little bit about Kennedy. Um, she's, she's been an absolute pleasure to coach this year. Um, at the district meet, she sprangs her ankle sprains her ankle. Um, she's a long jumper, triple jumper, high jumper, so you know those ankles are pretty important to her. Um, so between district and area, she spends most of her time in a uh, chiropractor office or a PT office getting scraped and, and manhandled around um, and, and just trying to get herself um, ready for area. Uh, we limit her jumping in area uh, to keep pressure off of her ankle. She qualifies in three events to the regional meet. Um, the regional meet, which again is one week later, um, we have a discussion, the coaches and I, about reducing her workload. Uh, pulling her out of uh, maybe the long jump and just focusing on uh, her, her better two and her response was a flat no. Uh, she qualified for those events, she wanted those events and she thinks she can get to the state meet in those events and so we stood back and were uh, very impressed by her just uh, drive there but um, get to the state meet uh, in two events in the high jump uh, and the uh, triple jump and um, just to highlight the high jump, um, I mean it, it's the Texas state meet, the best track state in the United States and uh, uh, nine high jumpers. Out of the regional meet, she was the ninth qualifier. She placed third, she didn't qualify for the state meet. Uh, UIL, because UT has a nine lane track, I don't know, maybe to one up the Aggies, uh, <laughs> they, allow, they allow a ninth competitor in every event. So the best third place out of the four regions. And she was that in both of those events. And so we get to 5'8 in the high jump, on her third attempt and she's doing her approach and she trips and falls and face plants, mm. right in front of God and country. They red flag it. Uh, and UIL man runs up and says, hey, she hasn't begun her jump. She was just in her approach, so it's okay. She can go back and start again. Well, it's her third attempt, and she had about two minutes to get back and you know, compose herself. So I'm thinking in the stands, this is probably it. Uh, she clears 5'8", and um, gets to 5'9", and something about that just shook her because she started jumping. 5'9", uh, first miss, but her hips were a couple inches over, and her dad, Ray, is going nuts in the stands, uh, turns around and points at me and says, she's going to clear this, and she does to win uh, her state title, and then carries on into the triple jump and gets a bronze, and, and um, again, wasn't supposed to do it. So uh, if I could characterize her in one word, it's just a fighter. She, she's just fantastic, and that's Kennedy Doe's. Our second athlete, Joshua English, I, I've been with Joshua for four years. He, he and I um, go a little bit further back. Uh, Joshua is a, a unique individual in that he's won uh, state cross country titles. He's run under 16 minutes for 5K. But if you go down the other end, he's run 47 seconds and changed for 400. Uh, he's, he's pretty rare in his range. Um, and so I, I truly believe that had COVID not come to town last year, I would have been here with him. Um, talking about another state championship that, that he would have likely won. Uh, but uh, 800 is his thing. Uh, it's what makes him tick. And uh, coming into this season, uh, low 152s to start off um, uh, his, his 800s. Um, and by the area meet, runs 150.52, which um, was currently Texas number two. Um, and um, gets to the state meet and leads wire to wire. Um, from, from start to end, actually negative splits, uh, goes 55.5 uh, and 55.45 uh, uh, to around 150.95. And he's currently has the fourth and fifth fastest times in the United States uh, for 800. And he's our state champion. Uh, 
uh, if the coaches on my staff, Chris Bells, Jennifer Hedges, Sean Hamilton, and Mike Tolliver, uh, would please come up for photos. Yes. Yeah, I need one more coming. There we go. Congratulations. Good job, you guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. There's no chance I could take it out. The car made me see you. Congratulations. Thanks so much. Ms. Phillips, congratulations. Outstanding. Outstanding. I'm only 5'8". You can clear me. I never catch you would have. Maybe the car. God bless you all. Congratulations. Outstanding. Great, great. Excellent. Is the fourth and fifth fastest in America? Right? Yeah. Mr. Speed. Yeah. All right. Okay, now we will move forward now with our uh, state champions once again from, the col from College Park High School. And Dr. Mark Merle, our principal, is here to make that introduction. President Hubert, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Knoll. We are excited to be here this evening to introduce a state champion as well as a relay state championship team. The four athletes that will be recognized are also great students. The competitiveness of each of them in the classroom and on the track shows their drive to be successful in all areas. At this time, it's my honor and privilege to introduce the state champion's coach, Mike Gibson. And I want to tell you a little bit about Mike. Mike has been our track, head track coach for the last 16 years uh, for all 16 years of College Park's existence. He is an outstanding coach, individual, role model. His I athletes highly respect him as he builds a strong relationship with each athlete that, it, that inspires them to do their best. His connections with his athletes is very special. And I want to pass on a little example uh, due to the recognition of this relay team. The team uh, that will be recognized tonight just competed in the regional meet in Waco when the team returned to the school the one athlete Joshua Asan stayed behind with his family to do a college visit at Baylor University after the family comp completed this visit over the weekend they proceeded home unfortunately they were involved in a horrific car accident Josh his mom younger brother were transported to a Bryan hospital his dad and sister were lifelighted to the Houston Medical Center. Oh. Josh and his little brother were fine, but found this event to be very challenging to handle. Family had been called, but it would be a while before they would arrive, and Josh needed support. He called Coach Gibson. Without hesitation, Coach Gibson was on his way to take care of his track family member and his little brother. The family is still in the process of healing, but the connection made a tragic situation a little easier knowing his coach was by his side the entire time. This is how Mike is all the time, a caring individual that is in this profession for the kids and uses track and teaching to make a difference in their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, our head coach, Mike Gibson. <laughs> I didn't need to. I was already nervous enough, Dr. Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Throw that in on me. Uh, thank you, uh, board, very much for having us out tonight. Um, and as Juris mentioned, as, as a teacher and as a coach, I cannot thank you what you guys have done for us this year. Uh, you've gone beyond the call of duty to help us out in the classroom, been patient with us as teachers and coaches, and allowing us to to get to where, where we're able to get to this year. And, it, and it's been a great ride. Um, <clears throat> this year, well, I'll date back to last year. Last year we had a great team. 
and we were we were so excited about getting to the state meet and re, you know we, we've got we've been to the state and we've we've gotten second and third and so forth but we've, we've never gotten to do the, the big thing at College Park and we were all excited and then obviously COVID hit and it was devastating for our guys uh, my phone <laughs> just was blowing up all the time kids were asking me all the way through end of april hey are we gonna have the state meet what can we do can this i mean the kids were running up and down the street doing workouts and um but we didn't have it and then when i came back this year and i started working the guys out it was different we were a family and it it meant more to them than it had ever meant before because something had been taken away from them and they knew how precious this gift was not only to compete but also to be in the classroom with their friends and, and to get their education in person so <clears throat> we get to the state meet and i'm going to introduce these kids first and then i'm going to talk them a brag on them real quick so the first person i want to introduce is connor washington and i'm gonna single connor out real quick uh Connor is a workaholic. This young man, you know, he'll go through my track practice and then he'll, he'll stay late at night with his dad working on his starts and, and he's a perfectionist. And it, it's been a joy to coach him over the years. Now, as Connor, when Connor was a junior, I mean, I'm sorry, a sophomore, he was third in the 400 in the state of Texas as a sophomore. And uh, did an amazing job at that young of age, at that big of a stage, did an amazing job at the state meet. So we all always assumed that he would repeat as 400 meter champion. Well, at the district meet, right before the district meet, Connor and I were talking and I was like, hey, what do you want to do? Because this is senior year, it's his decision on what he wants to compete in. I said, Connor, what do you want to do? He goes, coach, I want to run the 100 and the 200. And I thought about it, and I was like, you're really a quarter miler. <laughs> but we decided, hey, we'll give the 100 and the 200 a shot. And of course, Connor shined at, at district, do well at area, regionals, just blew away the field. Then we get to the state meet. And I knew Connor was nervous before the 100 because he kept asking me, Coach, what's the next form drill? I'm like, we've done form drills with this warm up millions of times. And I said, Connor, just, just, we're at knee grabs. It's all right, buddy. And we start cracking jokes and he starts to loosen up. But I don't know if you guys saw the 100 meter dash, but Connor runs, the gun goes off. And at the last couple of meters, he starts to lean a little bit too far forward and starts to lose his balance. Connor runs 9.9999, and the person who supposedly beat him ran 9.9998. Yeah. Officially, they're, both their times were 10 flat, the third fastest time in high school history in any condition in the United States ever. Banged up, because when he, when he finished, he did a flip on the track, banged up, uniforms all cut, cut up, he's all cut up, and he just lost by that close. And normal people would be upset, woe is me, whatever, but not Connor. Connor was, he was furious. And he, we get back to the camp to get ready, get ready for the 200, and I said, you good? He's like, I'm gonna win. <laughs> So, of course, you know, I, with me, I, I've always been jinxed with second place. And I, I just saw second place again by when the human eye can't see. And so um, he gets on that line for the 200, and I'm just like, dear God, please, just let everything go the way it's supposed to go. And that gun went off, and there was within five strides, I'm, I knew he, I, he won. It wasn't even close. And Connor ran 20.39. It is the second fastest time in the United States. As a <laughs> and very close to the state record. Now, the next group of guys I want to call up is our 4x4. Four four. Uh, the, our, one of our members could not be here today. Aiden Johnson, our leadoff leg, could not be up here today. But I do want to call up uh, Jay Henshaw, our, our, our third leg. Come on up, Jay. Marcus Scott the second. What was that name? <laughs> second leg. 
And I do want to call I do want to call out these two young men because they they are very important for us, and I'll talk about them in a minute. It is Senior Kurt Evangelister. And Junior Joshua Hassan. We had the luxury this year on our four by four. We had six kids on our team that could run 48 seconds or faster in the 400. Mm. And it, people said, well, it must be great having all this talent. And I, I kind of smiled. I was like, you didn't see them as eighth graders. Um, <laughs> but their, their talent in, their, in what they were able to accomplish is simply the fact that they were a family. And they relied on one another. They worked hard together. They may not have liked the workouts we were doing, but they knew that <laughs> <laughs> they knew that it, it, there was an end to it. They knew that there was a reason why we were doing it. And it was really neat to, to see them buy into the philosophy of lifelong learners, to be honest, because they took what, what was given in front of them and, and they learned from it and they kept building on it and building on it and building on it. For most of the year, Connor did not run on her four by four. And I knew we had something special when we ran, I think it was right out the gate, uh, we ran 317 without Connor on the team, which is fast in the four by four at that time of year. And the guys just fed off of it. And, and so when we ran at district, uh, you know, the, uh, everybody ran on but, but Connor. And then when we were at the regional prelims, you know, Kurt and Joshua ran on there. And I, I had to include Kurt and Joshua because both of those guys, even though they didn't run at the state meet, they were part of that team. They, they, if any one of these guys would have, would have had to, gotten injured or could not run, they would have popped right in there and we would have been just as fast or even faster. Because of that, and that's their character. They're, they are amazing human beings. Never once was, I, I deserve to, to run coach above so and so. I never heard that from these kids. And, and as a coach for 27 years, I've never had to deal with that before where kids were just, just, they were selfless. They just, they just wanted to do what was best for the team. So I want to brag about our team real quick. Uh, Aiden Johnson, who's he's at home sick uh, with a fever. Aiden Johnson leads us off. He's, you know, he he's probably I would brag. I think he's the best lead off four by four guy in the nation. And we, his nickname's Captain Caveman because he's got this long hair <laughs> and and he just eats it up. If those of you that are old know who Captain Caveman is, but. Uh, <laughs> But he, he just, once, once he handed it off, it was over. He, he'd, he'd opened up a lead, and Marcus uh, just even increased that lead even more. And, it, and I, at that moment, I just told myself as a coach, you gotta enjoy this. You, got, you, can't, you gotta let the nerves go and just be a fan and enjoy what, what you've been blessed with. And then I watched Marcus just open up that league, and, and then Jay Henshaw, on that third leg, just just killing it, getting out that first 200 like he's supposed to, and and then of course you know they're like, oh, Summer Creek's coming on, and of course Jay throws it down the last 50 and reopens up a huge gap, and then of course Connor Washington, uh, watching him run his last race for College Park High School, and watching him just do what he does, and running 46, I think we had 46.3 on on your last splits. And we ran 313.3, which is the number one time in the United States. And we, we <laughs> so I think the most grateful thing I, I have as a coach is the simple fact that I got to work with these young men. And it, it's not the winning. It, it was actually the thing I'm going to always remember is, is the workouts and the, the bonding times together that we had and watching them grow as athletes into outstanding young men and outstanding student athletes. And so it was a true pleasure with their performances. We were third in the state of Texas uh, team wise at the track meet. So we, we did place third, which was a fantastic feeling for them. So um, thank you guys very much, the board, for allowing us to, to come up here and be recognized. And, and thank you guys for such great memories and trusting me.
Congratulations to you. Yeah. Congratulations. Best luck to you. Congratulations. While they are being congratulated by the board, I just want to say congratulations, parents, teachers, students, administrators, everybody that made these students, uh, gave these students the ability to succeed and go above and beyond their probably most wildest dreams. Last year they didn't get to participate, but this year they did, and they did it well. So again, Congratulations. We are very, very proud of you. Well said, Ms. Magman. Thank you very much for those comments and congratulations once again, once again to everybody out there, the coaches and the sweet story that was shared as well. That's, that's important. Thank you for that. Moving on to item 2E, special board recognition for st students together achieving results, star program graduates, Dr. Noel. All right, we will invite Ms. Laura Willard, our college readiness specialist, to present this item. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Noel. Um, as we begin this week of commencement, we would like to recognize graduating seniors for their participation and commitment to the students together achieving results, our star program. Because of the end of the year activities, our STAR students are attending tonight virtually, but you can see their smiling faces on the screens. Um, this is our 12th group of seniors to graduate with this very special program, and we want to honor them for their hard work and their perseverance. Counselors were asked to identify entering ninth grade students who showed great personal and academic potential but who were struggling when they entered high school. These students were invited to, uh, to join STAR because you see STAR builds strong relationships between counselors and their students. As part of the STAR program, these students were exposed to opportunities that, that allowed them to really learn more about themselves as well as planning a future together. The STAR program has grown from just summer enrichment to a year-round comprehensive experience. STAR students and their counselors meet monthly, and they attend, they visit community colleges, technical schools, we take them to four-year universities, we visit job sites in the community, we listen to motivational speakers that are neighbors and friends, and they participate in leadership. This year, we found a way. We visited colleges virtually, and we Zoomed with career speakers and mentors. Um, this evening, we are so honored to have our star counselor from Conroe High, Miss Tiffany Holmes, and her senior, Cameron Hilliard, who want to, to share the star experience with you. Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, sure. The primary reason why I wanted to why I wanted to join the STAR program is because my oldest sister was a part of the group a few years before me. I saw how much fun she had visiting different colleges, meeting new people, and she actually found her desired college to attend through the STAR program at Prairie View and M University. My first my favorite thing about the STAR program was exploring different types of colleges, being able to meet and talk to new people and getting to see college life firsthand. For example, we got to see the dorm rooms, we toured, we toured the whole campus, we ate food in the dining hall, and we also received college merchandise. The experience was overall amazing and helped me gain knowledge on college, which is why I am proud to say I will, with the help from the STAR program and the football program, I will be attending Henderson State University on a full ride scholarship. where I plan on studying business finance as well as playing football for the school. I would like to thank Ms. Holmes and the other counselors for giving me this opportunity as well as the school district for having this program for students to be able to figure out what they want to do in the future and giving them options where to, where to further their education. With that being said, thank you so much for having me today. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. 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 Thank
Cameron Hilliard. Hilliard. And where did you go to college? Uh, Anderson State. Congratulations. Congratulations. Are you a Cameron sister or a girl? Thank you. I'm the counselor. I like you. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations, young man. Great job. Great job. Love hearing those stories. Item 2F, Special Board Recognition for Business Personal COVID-19 Response, Dr. Noel. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hubert. Yeah, I think we may need to make a rule where coaches have to come every month just yeah. to start us off. Like, <laughs> everything's better when the coaches talk. Yeah. I guess. Uh, it's awesome. But, you know, tonight we, we get another opportunity to celebrate those that have been working and, and uh, to make sure that, that our schools were able to stay open this year. And uh, this group we're going to recognize tonight are primarily behind the scenes folks. These are the, the, the people that, that are doing the work behind the scenes to make sure. And, you know, I've been. Uh, very positive about the way the year has gone and I've been hesitant to to get out you know and speak too soon but I but we're gonna make it now I I, I, I am we are we are gonna make it. so you know we have five and a half days left to school you we say, have you say that on the eve of a big storm I, I know I don't care like we'll deal with the rain tomorrow we're gonna deal with it but we're gonna make it um, it wouldn't be right if we didn't have something else, so that's okay. Uh, but 48 hours from now, we're, we will be watching graduates cross the stage, right. and that's why we do what we do. And uh, we we have achieved that, and, and through this entire process, to be the the lar the of the large districts in Texas to have the highest percentage of kids in the classroom. That happens because of all of these groups that we've seen, right? That, that have built trust with families to know that their kids will be safe in our schools. Uh, at the same time, to be probably one of, if not the largest district in the state of Texas that has been in school for the entire school year and never closed the campus is significant. And what makes that most significant <laughs> we should all be really proud of that because what makes that most significant is that our young people have the chance to interact with the teachers that we've seen. That, that's the difference maker. Every, everything we do here is about putting wonderful people in front of those kids. And, and you see it tonight, this, the relationships that are built, and that's what this has been. And so for these groups that we're going to meet tonight, these are the folks that, you know, they don't, they didn't expect to get recognized tonight. They just do their jobs. They do it behind the scenes. But yet without them, we wouldn't have had those opportunities. So I'll invite Dr. Hines to come up and introduce some special people for us this evening. Thank you very much. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noel. Uh, for the past several months, you have recognized several departments that have allowed the district to operate at such a high level during this pandemic. And tonight, it is an honor to present to you several more individuals representing our communications, our finance, our human resources, our technology, and our purchasing departments. And these valued team members have gone beyond the call of duty during this past year. And really, we couldn't recognize all these departments without also recognizing the leadership of our CFO, Darren Rice. Well, recognize him. <laughs> you know, as Dr. Noel mentioned tonight, we've had two themes that have kind of been a part of our mantra. And that is, um, it, with our STAR program, you heard about the importance of kids having a sense of future and how important that is in terms of, of, of their work and what they work towards. And the other theme is those meaningful adult relationships in their lives and that comes so often in the form of our extracurricular activities, but not just there, also in our, our academic areas and, and really all facets of, of what we do. Uh, tonight, you know, these departments, uh, in many ways, these are problem solving departments and um, they've all had their challenges as we kind of started off the year really having to deal with one problem and then another and then another and looking for solutions and and these are people that we go to for those and um, they have been instrumental so tonight uh, representing the communications department and certainly under the leadership of Sarah Blakelock who's uh, been outstanding leader for that group we have with us tonight and I'm gonna ask I'm gonna do each group one at a time we'll do it as a group and so if you'll come up and, for the picture and from communications, we have Celeste Brown. <laughs> Carol Gibson. <laughs> Abby Johnson. <laughs> K 
Katie Morton. And Andrew Stewart. And you know, a lot of this began early on with when we were putting together uh, the summer graduations. There was a lot of work to be done with signage and getting the stadium ready and uh, videoing and streaming and all these things. And this department did a great job with, uh, you know, coordinating all of that. We, we've had numerous YouTube live events, the signage that we put out to campuses, our social media presence, our uh, road, uh, maintaining the roadmap to reopening website, graphics that we put out, surveys. Uh, and then setting up Zoom for everyone. Uh, none of these were small, and these were just a few of the things that this department's been involved in. So um, the communications department want to recognize. We also want to recognize uh, some representatives from the finance department that uh, so many aspects, you know, we have a business continuation plan, but obviously during uh, times of if we're closed and if we're uh, working remotely, how do we maintain those business functions? And this department stepped up under the leadership of Becky Davis and payroll, Karen Garza and finance and, um, you know, everything from maintaining our payroll to getting the bills paid because the bills didn't stop coming, uh, <laughs> working with getting our campus budget set, um, all of those things, processing the different paperwork that needed to go through to get people in the system. So uh, tonight we're going to recognize from finance Shelly Cartwright. <laughs> Rachel Garrison. <laughs> Mary Head. Rachel Jimenez. Cindy Weistrup. Also want to give a shout out to Janet Stowers back there whose leadership is a big part of that department. they're going through the line I'm going to uh, mention a few things about human resources department our, our HR department who's led by Paula Green who can't be with us this evening um, you know stepped up we had a lot of questions about uh, leave we had a lot of questions about absences that we had to deal with we had to manage COVID leave this new thing that we came up with and had to get all these absences in place. We had to manage substitutes. There was a large number of substitutes that were needed this year. We had to answer questions, recruit and retain staff. Even I remember we did an auxiliary hiring fair uh, for bus drivers and custodians during the year. And they just stepped up at every step of the game. And I know under the leadership of Paula Green and uh, Dr. Jamie Bone and JJ Daw, they've just done an outstanding job. So tonight we're gonna recognize a few members from that department. With us this evening, Claire Amos. Dr. Jamie Bone. Chris Corson. Kathleen Crabtree. <laughs> T. 
Tiffany Matfield. Pina Medina. Not my way. Christy Stavanoa. <laughs> and Lauren Wisner. Next, we'd like to recognize some members from our technology department. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait, wait. we're going to get a picture. Picture. Not yet. Not yet. I got it. Sorry. Squeeze them. Here we go. Got it. Now we go. Now we go. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for all you do. Thanks so much for all you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for all you do. Thank you very much. Are you on mental health? Is that what Mental health. Next, we'd like to recognize some members from our technology department, which is uh, led by Terry McClarity. And they, this department stepped up on so many uh, levels, whether it was setting up our dashboard that we have uh, online, um, distributing computers, mobile hotspots uh, last spring, this, uh, this fall, this summer, developing apps. As we went through the year, we, had, we found ourselves having to have solutions for different problems. One of them was we had to have a way to report absences to the state. We had to track the data. We had to, we had to do a lot of contact tracing, so we needed a system for that. And they just stepped up and came up with a system that would work. Um, we, we had to come up with a way to have daily health screenings and check-ins. We even needed a system to manage seating at the stadiums for UIO requirements for seating capacities and then working on increasing mobile access points and Wi-Fi presence on campus. So those are just a few of the things that they were involved in early on in the year as we responded. And so tonight we're going to recognize from that department uh, Robert Davidson. <laughs> Daryl Idle. <laughs> Dan Kirk and Greg Morrow. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And finally, we would like to recognize the outstanding staff from our warehouse um, that is in our purchasing department, led by Rick Reeves and Ryan Titzman. Um, this this group stepped up in a big way. I, you know, I remember at one point this summer calling Rick and just saying, like, we're getting all these 18-wheeler trailers full of supplies from the state. Where are we going to put it? And um, and then really having to kick into gear of figuring out where to put all this PPE, not to mention we knew we had to go out and acquire a lot of equipment, hand sanitizer, gloves, masks, shields, dividers, all kinds of things that we needed to get uh, so we can open school. And so we went about acquiring it and then uh, 
uh, storing it, receiving it, moving it, and it was no small job. And, and these folks stepped up all along the way all summer to get it done, and uh, they did an outstanding job. So with us from the warehouse tonight, we have Elmer Aguilar. <laughs> Our supervisor, Ellie Bergeron. W.B. Black. <laughs> I don't think uh, he could make it, but we want to recognize Daniel Martinez. <laughs> Michael Perry. Cody Scott. Mark Wagner. And Jody Westra. As they're working their way through, just on behalf of the board, we want to say thank you to all these different departments. These are the people you don't see necessarily on the campuses and the classrooms um, at the football stadiums. Uh, but without them, the district does not run. Uh, people don't get paid. Leave doesn't get processed. Items don't get delivered. Um, the message that, uh, that school's being closed because the weather doesn't get out. Um, these are really the people behind the scenes that help these educators and these administrators do what they do. And so from the bottom of our heart it's on all of us on the board thank you very much for all you do we appreciate you all right thank you mr. Moore I appreciate your comments they do we do echo those from the from the board standpoint uh, moving on to item 2 G special board recognition for mental health awareness month dr. Noel all right uh, as the district observes uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, we're pleased to have Ms. Denise Sapola, our coordinator of guidance and counseling here uh, to bring us some words. President Hubert, um, Board of Trustees and Dr. Null, on behalf of our uh, guidance and counseling department who are here with me tonight, we wanna thank you so very, very much for your unceasing support of our policies, our programs, and our people resources which promote and enable us to teach resilience, coping strategies, and develop skills that become habits for each of our students. This focus on emotional intelligence and mental health empowers them toward personal and academic success. Not only is mental health a priority for our students, for each of our teachers and our staff. This focus on supporting mental health for all of CISD draws educators and counselors to be a part of our efforts by seeking employment in CISD. We are so grateful for everything that you are enabling us to accomplish. A special thing that happened this year is the Texas Counseling Association, TCA, awarded their Layperson Exemplary Service Award of 2020 to our very own Dr. Curtis Null. This award is presented annually. Yes. This award is presented annually by the Texas Counseling Association to a layperson as recognition for his or her exemplary service in the support and promotion of guidance and counseling in the state of Texas. On behalf of all of the 158 counselors in CISD, thank you so much for your advocacy and your support. Thank you, Dr. Null. Thank you. Ms. Sapolo, before you, before you sit down, you please come back for a second. It, it's okay, Denise. We're not going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I just wanted to read a statement. Uh, May is the, men is the National Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, and our very own Tri-County Consumer Foundation here in Conroe is challenging all people to perform one act of uh, kindness every day during the month to remind people of the importance of mental health awareness programs and the need for training such as mental health first aid so that you can help yourself and someone else who is in need. According to the National Council of Mental Well-Being, one in five U.S. adults experiences mental illness every year. One in 20 U.S. adults experiences serious mental illness each year. One in six youth aged 6 to 17 experience a mental health disorder each year. The CDC reported that suicide was the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 24 and the fourth leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 35 and 54. And lastly, 60% of high school students, 60% of high school students with mental illness never graduate. So how can you make a difference? You, our community. Some people feel ashamed or considered a personal weakness to seek help. Parents feel like they failed if their child is suffering. You can help by being a friend. You can help by finding them resources and showing them you care and always be kind. Listen to how people may reach out to you, the words they use, how they say them. Just make yourself available to them. Don't judge them, but rather understand them, and they are asking for your help. They came to you. Thank them and encourage other mental health professionals who are making a difference in the lives of those they serve. And as our 158 counselors do, love kids and let them know you care and teach them resiliency. And then final, uh, I just want to make this statement to all mental health professionals in Conroe ISD and to all of us as community citizens. We need to spend each day with passion and purpose and to inspire others by living a life of joy, compassion, and kindness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Ms. Cipolla. Appreciate you. All right. Item... Three, citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey, has, has anybody signed up for tonight that you're aware of? Yes, they have. Should we? Who would we want? Oh. There, there might be a few, but anyway, I'll just go on. All right, the next item on the agenda is public comments for those who have registered to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Everyone is reminded that this portion of the meeting is not the appropriate forum for bringing complaints for which resolution is sought. Before complaints can be submitted to the Board of Trustees as an agenda item, they must be addressed by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures. Also, please keep in mind that the Board has an obligation to protect the confidentiality of information that could personally identify a student. The Board cannot permit comments that include student names or any information that might identify a specific student. This prohibition does not apply to if the person speaking is the student's parents or guardian or is o over the age of 18 and speaking about him or herself. If an issue is mentioned that is on tonight's posted agenda, the board will defer its discussion of the issue until the item is reached on the agenda. For any subject that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision but it can furnish special factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Each person is limited to no more than three minutes for their comments. This will allow the board to hear from citizens as well as ensure that the board meeting runs efficiently, as there are many important items on the board's agenda that must be considered. Each speaker's three minutes time limit will be displayed on the screen around the, around the room. I think that's gonna be here, correct? Here, mm -hmm. here and there, everywhere. Um, displayed on screen when the when the when the countdown time reaches zero the speaker's time has come to an end and the next speaker will be called everyone in attendance is reminded to treat all speakers with respect regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the speaker, speaker's message any person who does not conduct him or herself accordingly will be asked to leave and will be escorted from the room 
So I mind you, it, we had to cut it to three minutes because we have so many people and we want to hear from you. We appreciate everybody's opinion and we want to hear from you, but we just ask that you be respectful to one another and to also the timer when the time is up that you, you exit from there. So with that, Ms. Godfrey, will you please call your first person? Jesus Mendoza. Mr. Mendoza is unable to attend the meeting. In accordance with CISD procedure BED, Mr. Mendoza is submitting his comments in writing to the Board of Trustees. His comments relate to electro hypersensitivity. Thank you. Connor Ernest. Hello, President Hubert, members of the board. My name is Connor Ernest. I come to you this evening as a 13-year student in CISD schools and a 15-year resident of the Woodlands of Montgomery County. Through my time at the Woodlands High School, McCullough Junior High, and Derrickson Elementary, I've come to learn and, know, learn and know more than I could have ever believed because of my time in the classroom, on the basketball court, and on the track. I'm here to give you my testimony on the district-wide mask mandate, unbalanced teaching methods, and discrimination against conservative views. I wanted to take the time to talk to you about the mask mandate today, but because of Governor's Abbott, Governor Abbott's executive order that came out today, GA36, governmental entities are now prohibited from mandating ma face coverings or restricting activities in response to, COVID to the COVID-19 pandemic. This also goes along with the fact that CISD has said that they will not be requiring masks starting June 1st. Nonetheless, what a CDC MCPHD, Montgomery County Public Health District or department, or Governor Abbott executive order might say, it is not law. Although the Texas Constitution and Texas Education Code is the law, what example have you set for your 60,000 students with shredding of the law that you are governed by? On another note, I can assume that everyone on this board is not racist, but by the doctrine of critical race theory, this board is made up of oppressors and oppressed. Critical race theory views all white people in society as being inherently racist and teaches that whites have power over all other ethnic groups. When we have teachers in this district exclaiming, and I quote, whites have power over blacks and we don't even need to pretend it happened during slavery times, end quote, while teaching critical race theory and going on to openly endorsing the idea of raising their children genderless, that's a problem, and that's just the half of it. Lastly, for a year and a half, I patiently pursued and waited to have a conservative-minded club on the campus of my high school. I was denied my constitutional rights time after time because it was political in nature, even though many clubs already present at the school were political in nature. I was told my club's presence would disenfranchise my peers and make people feel unwelcome. This has since been resolved, and I'm thankful for that. But there are many ongoing accounts of bias against conservative thought happening at other schools in this district. Conservatives welcome open debate, while the opposing views want to eliminate debate by accusing conservatives of being racist, homophobic, xenophobic, etc., without evidence, and push for conservatives to be taken off of platforms and banned from public spaces. I call that in the future this board resents the use of all mass mandates in any way, shape, or form as they are in direct violation of Texas law and the teaching of critical race theory because future discrimination does not fix past discrimination and takes swift actions against teachers who continu continue to force their views upon their students. And lastly, discrimination against conservative views is rampant in most places where education is taught. CISD is no different, but it can be. Do something about it when it happens so students like myself do not need to bring it into the limelight. Now I'd like to play a quick video for you guys. So critical theories unit, this is where the shit gets real. Okay, so you can't hold back. So what do you really mean? Can we say white have power over black, please? Yeah. Okay, thanks. And we don't even have to pretend that it was during slavery times. Because if we were really just saying during slavery times, we wouldn't have mass riots even happening today. Thank you, Connor. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Hubert. Thank you, Dale and Mint. We have to have it really Gabriel, Bill Forty. Um, good evening, President Hubert, yes. members of the board, Dr. Nell. I'm Gay Bill Forty, Gabriel, uh, father of four uh, Conroe ISD students. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge the board and Dr. Nell for their leadership and vision during the pandemic. I think you did the right thing, so I appreciate it. I'm here to petition for the creation of a new magnet STEM school in the Woodlands. And I propose the Woodlands High School as a location for this new academy. 
the current Academy of Science and Technology at College Park High School, or AST, fails to meet the second and third Conroe ISD school board goals and objectives. It has been unable to provide quality education to hundreds of students to achieve their full potential. And it has questionable admission criteria that ignore the third Conroe ISD school board goal of closing the achievement gap between minorities. According to Ms. Carrie Galaras, the, CIA, uh, the Conroe ISD Legal Counsel, the AST has accepted only 45% of the qualified applicants over the last five years. That's only 80 students annually. It has rejected almost <coughs> 600 qualified students in the previous five years. For example, I met a student who took the pre-SAT this year. That student scored at 99th percentile in math and 98th percentile overall, and was involved in, with robotics for many years. Nice. That student did not make it. How can you explain to that particular kid and others that Conroe ISD cannot afford focused quality education for them? If budget were a concern, I'm positive that the Woodlands alone could afford much more than a very small STEM school. Just this year, the real estate market in the Woodlands is experiencing a significant increase in market valuation. So if tax, if tax rates were to remain the same, there would be enough budget for another STEM academy in the Woodlands next year. Conroe ISD does not provide a challenging curriculum to many high potential students in the Woodlands, and nobody's doing anything about it. The creation of a new academy provides benefit for the qualified students that were left out However, it will also improve the diversity in ASD. The current and historical demographic distribution in ASD is unusual. 96% of the students are either Asian or white in a district zone that has 27% Hispanics. And for African Americans, it's worse. The ASD admission criteria play a critical role in this tremendous lack of diversity. And the ASD leadership chose to ignore or fail to adopt any concrete plan to improve it when one of the stated ASD believes, and I quote, is we benefit from diversity. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's okay. We appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank Kathy you. Lucetta. Thanks for giving me the time to speak. I am here to stand against CRT being taught in our schools. Critical race theory, theory is a descendant of critical theory, a philosophy that began in Frankfurt, Germany in the 1920s and 30s at the Frankfurt School. It was one of the first Western Marxist school patterned after Marx Engels Institute in Mas Moscow. The Frankfurt School scholars fled to Columbia University Teachers College in New York in 1934 to escape persecution from the Nazis. They purposefully erased the word Marxism from their research papers so they would not attract attention in America. Critical race theory was an insidious attack on Western institutions and norms to tear them down. It built upon the work of philosophers such as Nietzsche, Hegel, and best known disciple Karl Marx. Critical theory evolved into critical race theory in the late 1970s and 80s. CRT built upon critical theories philosophy and the world, world, world is based on systems of power and claims that American law is systematically oppressive. CRT goes further to claim that America is systematically racist that, and this racism produces an alliance between working class whites and the oppressor capitalist class which ultimately prevents working class solidarity which is blatantly a false claim. CRT holds these ideas. There is no absolute truth. This is ludicrous. Individuals are either oppressors or victims. Again, ludicrous. America is systematically racist and must be dismantled. Ludicrous. CRT is an agenda-driven philosophy and has no place in Texas or the American classrooms. <laughs> The, the logical questions on the minds of Montgomery County taxpayers at this point are, 
Will the Carmel ISD board commit to stop this anti-American and Marxist ideology being taught and propagandized in your schools, in our schools, immediately? And in conclusion, anyone on the CISD board who opposes, who, I'm sorry, who approves this anti-American and Marxist curriculum in our school system qualifies as a useful idiot, which is which is what Vladimir Lenin thought about communist sympathizers in America. Thank you. Ryan Osho. Which, who is this? Thank you, members Ryan. of the board. Ryan Jarcho. I'm sorry if you didn't okay. hear me. Sorry about that. I didn't hear. <clears throat> Thank you, members of the board, for allowing me to speak tonight. One of your students urged me to come speak. My name is Ryan Jarko, and I'm running to be your congressman in District 8. I'm here tonight to speak out against CRT and socialist propaganda overtaking our school system. I am a working class patriot who sees the undermining of our constitution and the destruction of our rights happening around the country. It is the future of our children that is being decided today. As a product of the public school system, I strongly believe in providing the next generation a quality education that prepares them to compete in the global marketplace. We should be teaching students the basics of economics, basics like supply and demand, or incentivizing innovation. If we did this, our children would understand why America is the best country to ever exist. There are far too many in my generation and younger who lack knowledge about our constitution and the greatness of our country. That's why we are seeing an acceptance of socialism. If they had been educated on the failures of socialism and how our system, while not perfect, is the best in the world, we would not see this push to have the government run every aspect of our lives. We are a free nation of people who should self-determine and not rely on the government to run our lives. Another failure that is now sweeping our nation is the push to teach critical race theory. How does this unite our country? It doesn't. It will only further create racial divide. Critical race theory pushes racial stereotypes and teaches children that we are to be defined and judged by our skin color, not our character. Our classrooms are not a place for social experimentation. Teachers should be focusing on teaching our children the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. Students should be learning our country's unbiased history and origins. They should not be taught biased personal political views. As Benjamin Franklin said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. While our country has made terrible mistakes in the past, to teach our children that we are a racist society is just plain wrong. Parents are sending their children to school to get a lesson in Marxist theory? Let's keep politics out of the classrooms and teach our children to critically think for themselves so they have the best chance at succeeding in this world. Our country depends on them being educated. We must not fail them. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Lily Cole. No Lily. Okay. Matthew Russell. Thanks for having me. My name is Matthew Russell. I'm speaking tonight on critical race theory. I might be unique a little bit. I was product of Connor Independent School District. I've lived, but I've lived uh, in Washington, D.C. the last 11 years, recently moved back. New voter and taxpayer here in the district. Glad to be back, but I've seen practically what critical race theory does to people. It's meant to divide and destroy and to encourage hate. If you don't know, the one thing, if you're going to describe critical race theory, is it seeks to take away the dignity of man. That's what it does. It dehumanizes people solely based on their skin color, and that's it. That is it, and that's wrong. It seeks to encourage hate. We can't teach our kids that. The other way I'm unique, I don't have kids here. I hope to have kids in the school system. But again, I've seen what this has done practically. It tears families apart, literally. Not just people in this room, families. We can't let that happen. There's Democrats on this board. There's Republicans on this board. This is not a political issue. Vody Bauckham, John MacArthur. Two prominent pastors in this country. One is black, one is white. They are both against this with everything they have. Why? Because it teaches hate. 
We cannot teach our kids to hate. We have to teach them to love and to come together. What have we worked for all these last few years, all these last several decades? I know our system isn't perfect. I get that. But that's where we can get up right now and talk about it. We cannot let that stand here. And don't let Governor Abbott have, don't blame it on the governor and say he has to pass a bill. Do it here. You do it. We want to see leadership from you, Democrats and Republicans. Thank you. Amber Shippum. Amber Shippum. Hello, members of the board, Dr. Knoll and President Hubert. I'm here today as a resident of Montgomery County, a CISD constituent, mother, and speaking on behalf of the Montgomery County Young Republicans as their president. I wanted to take my time up here today to talk about the resolution that we passed a couple days ago condemning the mask mandates, critical race theory, and discrimination against conservative views. Earlier, Connor, who's also one of our fantastic and our youngest members, um, simply covered the mask mandate. Um, and I would encourage you all to heed what he said. Over the years, our public school system has morphed into something it was never meant to be. Our schools are not for ideology, they're meant to educate. When you allow valuable time to be wasted on teaching our children racism and segregation, oppression of independent thought, and to place collective guilt on them, everything that is critical race theory, our children are hurt. CRT incites hatred and injustice, and as a board that exists simply to protect the interests of the students, the parents, and constituents of this ISD, you'll need to take a strong stand against critical race theory. It's sad that we have to come here to fight for our children's innocence, for their youth, and for their experiences. It's not the school's job to raise our children and for all of y'all to allow individual ideologies to promote, be promoted in the classroom. And finally, as Dr. Noel well knows, because he's received countless emails on the subject, our students specifically at Oak Ridge High School, Woodlands High, and College Park High, others within the, within the district, students' rights are being suppressed based on the members of this board, as well as some of the teachers whose personal opinions don't line up with the clubs that students are wanting to start. It's discrimination, and it is, state, as it's stated in a standing rule and test issued from the recent U.S. Supreme Court, the students' constitutional rights do not end at the schoolhouse gate. Connor was able to overcome this issue this semester after a long and drawn out fight, but the other students deserve better. This needs to end and the students informed that any and all clubs, as long as they fall within the written guidelines of the school, can be formed regardless of leadership's personal opinions. Thank you. Gail Drummond. Good evening, President Hubert, Dr. Dahl, members of the board. I am honored to be here this evening to tell you about my friend, Becky Page. Becky was born and raised in Conroe, Texas. <clears throat> she graduated from Conroe High School. She has taught at Armstrong Elementary, B.B. Rice Elementary. She was an assistant principal at B.B. Rice and principal. She moved to Reeves Elementary and then to Giesinger Elementary. Becky is known for making a difference in the lives of children, developing meaningful relationships with parents, positive and impactful leadership with her teachers, being a positive role model for teachers and administrators with whom she worked. Everywhere Becky went, she made a difference. She was selected by Dr. Don Stockton to lead campuses because of her expertise, knowledge, and leadership skills. She embraced educational practices that resulted in her student success on state assessments. Becky expected her students to succeed. Failure was not an option. Becky was a positive change agent as, and has been admired by all who have had the opportunity to work with her. I personally watched listened and learned from Becky when I was a principal in Conroe ISD. 
She has been a presenter in Conroe ISD, shared her knowledge with other districts, and at the state level. Becky was Region 6 TEPSA President. She was Region 6 TEPSA Principal of the Year. Reeves Elementary Humanitarian. Sam Houston State University awarded her as, as a distinguished educator. Region 6 gave Giesinger the Blue Ribbon Performance Award and the High Performance Award, and Giesinger was a national Blue Ribbon School. That's a big deal. She continues to make a difference as a retired educator. She has been a member of Conroe Service League since 1978 and having been a member of Assistance League Montgomery County for almost six years, she is the incoming president of that organization for this coming year. Becky has made a significant contribution to the lives of children, to fellow educators in Conroe ISD and beyond, and to the Conroe community. In my opinion, Rebecca S. Page Elementary School is the perfect name for the new elementary school in the Conroe High School Theater. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. David Burka. David Burka. Trustees, Dr. Noll. Critical race theory. It is oppressive and the ones teaching it are the oppressors. We're gonna to have to understand that in our heart and soul. We have to get it in our spirit that this is being done without the consent or knowledge of the parents. What, el what else is being done with critical race theory? It's destructive, not only to the psyche of the child, not only to the cohesion of the community, but it is destructive against our nation and against our state. We must condemn it. It is also, critical race theory is also something that is forced upon our children by some people. Now, to get you off the hook, because the community is here to help you. Really, the whole district needs to be accepting the help of the community. And we will do that. We will do that constructively, peacefully, and with the correct intent. Now, if we as a community decide to introduce chaos and overthrow of our government, then by all means, we need to embrace critical race theory. If we wish to um, Im impress our own students with someone else's, as Kathy, correctly illustrated, someone else's theory and philosophy of not only government, but human conduct, then by all means, stay with critical race theory. Continue to force it upon our students. If, Dr. Noll, you're a good example for this, if we decide to allow critical race theory to be a mandate, then we should repudiate and we should reject the benefits of Western civilization. Now, we all benefit from that. We use these uh, amenities. We give them away to the entire world. We do not hold them in a racial context, nor do we hold them in a specific, like, um, mandating monetary context. We freely in America give these things away. Electricity, our motor vehicles, the whole nine yards. So we can maintain critical race theory and all its tenets and not repudiate the amenities and the benefits that Western civilization has given us and we end up being hypocrites. Now, we're here to help and protect you all. It's not my job to put you all on notice. Someone else will do that. We want this corrected, we want this condemned, and we want you to do the right thing, and we're here to help. Thank you. James Drabelbus. She's close. She's close. Very close. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Distinguished board, 
It's six minutes. Skeeter, <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Noll, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you this evening. And first off, I just want to say thank you for your service to our community. I can't think of anything more important than the youth of our community, and it was so enriching to listen to our coaches tonight. And I agree with you. They should start every meeting. Tonight, I'm before, standing before you uh, in support of a dear friend, uh, Dr. Joanne Bacon, and recommending her as uh, the naming rights for the new junior high school. Uh, no, most of you know her. Uh, she started uh, her career as a teacher and educator in special education in 1974 in her old high school in Groveton. And then she came to Conroe and started an illustrious career here as a special education teacher, uh, then special ed supervisor and diagnostician district-wide from 1979 to 87, where then she became a principal from 1987 to 2013 at Crockett, then at Washington, and finally at the Hawk Alternative High School, where she served actually 16 years as principal. And amazing, during that period of time, she managed to return back to Sam Houston and get her master's degree and her doctorate. And during that time, she was also recognized three times, 83, 87, and 98, as Humanitarian of the Year. And then in 2009, as the regional, Region 6 High School Principal of the Year, and then in 2010, as the TSDA Texas State High School Principal of the Year. What I saw more than the awards was Joanne's heart. I've known her for over 40 years, and there is no one that loves more her kids, her teachers, and her community. There's something about legacy. It's not what you leave behind. It's the lives you touch. And Joanne's legacy is amazing, what she did in Conroe. And she's very deserving of having the school named after. And Ray, I'm now going to do my good deed for the month, and I'm going to give you back some of your time. Thank you. <laughs> Joseph Liu. I'll do it when I can. Good evening. I would like to thank the school board for the opportunity to express my concerns. I have, my name is Joe Lou. I'm a physician in, the, uh, in Woodlands. I have two children who attend school in Conroe ISD, a son in the sixth grade and a daughter in the second grade. I have lived in the Conroe ISD district since 1995. That's 26 years for people who are mathematically challenged. The incident that I want to discuss with you today involves my son and his orchestra teacher, Ms. Alicia Gibbs at Collins Intermediate School. My son, through hard work, determination, and endless practices during last summer was selected as a first year first violin. This is also known as a concertmaster of his orchestra. Being concertmaster is a great honor in orchestra. The concertmaster is considered the assistant conductor. However, two days before the spring concert, which is the big concert of the year, he was replaced by another student who was essentially the tenth chair in the school orchestra. This student jumped nine chairs. This is quite a high hurdle. I don't know if you folks have been orchestra or band, but that's an incredible jump. When I asked Ms. Gibbs right at the concert why my son was replaced at the last minute for the most important concert of the year, her answer was that she wanted to give this other student, quote, the opportunity, unquote. She then walked away from me and refused all communication with me since then. To me, quote, opportunity, unquote, sounds a lot like discrimination. I was allowed to meet with the school principal and the coordinator for the fine arts at Conroe State, but not the teacher. The next day, I discussed my concerns. In a meeting that lasted an hour and a half, the only answer I could get from these two people was that they had no answer and they would have to get, to me, get back to me after they spoke to Ms. Gibbs the following day. By the way, they never got back to me. When I asked, Ms. Gibbs, why, when I asked them why Ms. Gibbs was in president of our meeting, they said they did not want to, quote, traumatize her, unquote. So they were okay with traumatizing and humiliating my son. My son was sick over this incident. He didn't eat or sleep for three days until I told him that we, we would complain about this, about what happened to him so it doesn't happen again to anybody else in this school district in the future. But they're okay, again, it's traumatizing my son, but not this teacher who's a grown woman. Besides, I'm offended when they tell, when, that they feel that I would traumatize Ms. Gibbs. This reminds me of the Central Park Karen incident in New York City, who called the cops on an African-American gentleman who was simply watching birds like he was going to assault her. Do white people think that all minorities are out here to assault them? This is, this is incredible. I'm very offended. When, in addition, I was told by Ms. LeBlanc, the principal, that seating for a spring concert, quote, rotated, unquote. 
When I asked why this particular student was selected as the only student to be rotated and not the other 29 violinists in the orchestra, again, she had no answer. For those of you who think this is so, what, big deal, how would you like if your son was the starting quarterback for your high school team and for the state championship game, he was, quote, rotated out to give another student an opportunity to play the starting quarterback? Would you be happy with that? That's not fair. Promotion should be based on merit only, not the color of your skin. In addition, Thank you. In addition, there was no rotation among the nine cellists or 11 violas. I'm sorry. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I, I, I get it. We get it. We get passionate. We get it. But we do have to move I'm on. I'm sorry. Thank you again for the board. Thank Appreciate it. No Thank you. <laughs> Cynthia Sizelove. Good evening. I'm going to change what I plan on speaking about today. And... I'm not going to thank you quite yet. I will thank you when we start to see some changes. You are all in these seats for a reason. Our children are in your hands. We are here to speak to that, what you're doing, and frankly, what you're not doing. I was so pleased to hear what you said about mental health awareness. Our mental health awareness is important. However, isn't it a shame that we have to remind people to be kind? That should be something that is natural. That is something that we should be doing like breathing. Mental illness. We have six-year-olds that have to wear a mask. They can't breathe. They don't want to wear it. They can't see expressions. There is no, <clears throat> there is no scientific evidence to say that a mask will do anything. Where are the adults in the room? I have teenagers. I have 14, three 14 year olds. Oops. Prayers needed. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you, we have big problems in our schools. My daughter was given a phone. Different story. However, she wanted to get on to the McCullough um, threat. She thought she could make friends, she could find people to do homework with. You know what it was? It was pornography. Pornography on your web, on your Wi-Fi. You better be very careful about that. They were talking about putting alcohol in the hand sanitizers. The nastiness that was on that is ridiculous. Why do we push screen time with our kids? Put every assignment, homework, everything on the phones. Let's get away from them. Get them out of the classrooms. Get them out of the classrooms. They're in the, the lockers. They don't go into the classrooms. Let's get back to doing things the old-fashioned way. Take these stinking masks off of all of you. It doesn't make sense. You had your mask. You had your mask off. People are taking pictures with their masks off. Where are the adults? Come on, people. Let's think here. We go, we go into a restaurant. We go into a restaurant. There's an imaginary line. Here you gotta wear one, there you don't. Our kids are eating in cafeterias at school with no masks. They're going to the bathroom and flushing toilets with their hands that they've touched. Now come on, really? Are we really this dumb? <laughs> if you gotta have the gumption, you make good salary. We all know what your salary is. You have to have the gumption to do the right thing for our children. Diane Daniels. Uh, good evening. Um, I am aware of what Governor Abbott did with the masks for June 4th, and I am aware of what you all have done for June 1st. But that's not enough. Now is when we need to have the masks come off. Last month I discussed to you about the removing the mask mandate in the children. Facts were stated and the violation of the Nuremberg Code of 1947 was referenced. Since then the masks are still being forced to be worn, as this everybody here knows. This month I bring to you the attention of the Texas Education Code 37.0023, which states 
You are not allowed to impair a student's breathing, including any procedure that involves obstruct obstruction of a student's airway, including placing an object in, on, or over a student's mouth or nose, or placing a bag or cover or mask over the student's face. That is the Texas Education Code, which each and every one of you received this evening because I gave you a copy, if you're unfamiliar of it, which is your job to know about it. <laughs> Next. The oxygen level when wearing a mask drops down 17%. Oxygen readings that are healthy are 95 to 100. Below 95 is low, below 92 is dangerous. Below 90 is very dangerous. 17% of 95 to 100, you do the math, you're very educated. The CDC is now being sued by 10,000 doctors and 1,000 lawyers for falsifying their fines on the COVID-19 results. The CDC is a private business. We did not elect the CDC. We elected you and all of you are failing your position to protect our children. If, you cannot count, if I cannot count on you to do the best interest of the children, your immediate resignation should be asked for. You are personally hurting the children and your staff, mind you. This is not just about the children, it's about the staff. Act immediately to correct your decision regarding mass mandate. I'll pray for all of you that you make the right decision. In regards to critical race theory, get rid of it. This 917 society's objective is to get the Constitution, a pocket Constitution, and the Bill of Light Rights in every single hand of an eighth grader. Now, if you can't do it, I will personally request from you how many campuses have eighth graders and what is the enrollment for this coming year, and I will personally order them and deliver them to each campus. Get rid of social studies and critical race theory and teach our history. Robbins. Good evening. My name is Scott Robbins. I'm a parent of a child in Conroe ISD. I'm also an elected precinct chairman for Precinct 33 in Montgomery County. That is the most populous precinct in this county. It is encompassed entirely by Conroe Independent School District. I say that to say this. I have standing. I have means and I have motive for what comes next. Trustees, generally. Dr. Null, specifically. On May 6th, I sent you an email entitled, you are in serious violation of specific sections of the Texas Education Code. It read, and I will read it word for word, Dear Superintendent Null, attached is a PDF copy of the Texas Education Code section 37.0023 with relevant subsections highlighted. I am certain you're familiar with it. No part of the Texas Education Code may be amended without legislative <coughs> approval. Please respond with what steps you're taking to compel the district staff to cease and desist committing these crimes against the children of Conroe ISD. Specifically, relevant sections of 37.0023 states, you will not deny adequate air or physical comfort to a student. You will not impair the student's breathing, including any procedure that involves obstructing the student's airway, including placing an object in, on, or over the student's mouth or nose, or placing a bag, cover, or mask over the student's face. You will not. A school district or school district employee or volunteer or an independent contractor of a school district may not apply an aversive technique. That's what these are called under the law. Or by authorization, order, or consent, cause an aversive technique to be applied to a student. Dr. Null, to your credit, you responded to me the very next day, and I will read it verbatim. Mr. Robbins, we have utilized masks as one of our virus mitigation strategies this year under the advisement of the Texas Education Agency and public health officials. This is a matter of public health, and they are not used as aversive technique. We will continue to require masks for the remainder of the school year. Starting June 1st, masks will be recommended but optional for students and staff at Conroe ISD facilities. I want to remind you, Texas Education Agency and your imagined public health officials are not the Texas legislature. You have violated the law. 
your defense was that you're not using these masks as an aversive technique, but instead as a, a mitigation strategy for the virus. Let me go on and be clear with the law with you so you understand what comes next. An aversive technique under the law does not require intent. It does not require intent. It requires only action on the part of the person or persons violating the law. That's you. Therefore, an action that is considered aversive punishment is still aversive punishment even when administered for reasons other than to punish. So I ask you, what are you doing to cease and desist violating the law against our students? Stacy Ernest. Good evening, board. My name is Stacy Ernest, and I am the mother of a CISD student, Connor Ernest, who you heard from tonight. I also have another son whom did not graduate from Conroe ISD. My husband and I pulled our older son out of Conroe ISD in his early years. We pulled him out because of ongoing discrimination and personal biases from his teachers, students, and lack of support from Conroe ISD administrators tied to his Asperger's. While our older son was at Conroe ISD, he was constantly harassed, bullied, and every incident was always his fault. We had anonymous letters mailed to our home about the treatment from teachers to our son. We had teachers tell us, quote, I had given him the tools in the toolbox. It is now up to him, end quote. He was in elementary school when this was said. I had teachers complain that he would not eat a salad at lunch, knowing he had texture issues and that would make him gag and throw up. He began to lose faith in God and in his teachers himself. And he contemplated suicide in sixth grade. We pulled him out of this environment and put him in an environment where he could focus on his academics and grow as a person. Despite those personal biases towards him in those early years, our son is in college, a sophomore in college, and is aspiring to be a history teacher. I stand before you tonight because you are allowing teachers to openly share their personal bias and discriminatory behaviors and comments in the public classroom. Our voices and the voices of our kids must be heard. You are allowing teachers to teach divisive, critical race theory, theory to our view, children and, um, and our kids and our teenagers. Why you continue to perpetuate these destructive ideals is beyond me. We should look at our people for what they are. They are humans, and they are all created equal, and they should be treated with dignity and respect. Go back to teaching the, the fundamentals in which our kids can reach their full potential. Get personal biases out of the classroom and out of the public schools and stop the indoctrination of young minds that are harmful biases. Thank you for your time. God bless America. Ginger Russell. I hadn't started yet. You want to restart my time? I'm, I don't have it. I'll, I'll give you more. I'll give you 10 seconds extra if that's what you would like. America's founding principles and Judeo-Christian values are being undermined at every turn. Sadly, our government-run public schools have the greatest opportunity and ability at indoctrinating and social engineering the next generation, our children. The new rage in our public schools is the outcome-based education philosophy of social-emotional learning. SEL's evil occultism roots come from the New Age Fetzer Institute, whose mission is to build upon a spiritual foundation for a loving world. This spiritual foundation is not built on Judeo-Christian principles. Unfortunately, Conroe ISD has implemented this evil teaching philosophy of social-emotional learning. SEL works to change a student's attitudes, values, beliefs, and behavior. Here is an example of how SEL works. On the online app called Brain Pop, available to students, is a lesson on Gay Pride 2020. Within their review quiz, it asks, 
What is one way to be a good ally to one of your LGBTQ peers? The multiple choice answers are stand up for your gay classmate that is getting bullied, two, participate in a Pride Month celebration, three, speak up for the importance of LGBTQ rights, or all of the above. The correct answer was all of the above. Does this not encourage Christian students to compromise their biblical values by asking them to promote LGBTQ rights and participate in their celebrations? This ideology behind SEL is Marxist, promoting social justice, racial equity, critical race theory, and global citizenship. What SEL ultimately does is remove the ugliness and the shock of what God calls sin. When we allow our schools to indoctrinate our children by feeding them a world filled with tolerance and inclusion for things that go against our Judeo-Christian beliefs and values, it will continue to change our nation to no longer see the world as God sees it and will surely bring judgment on our nation sooner that rather than later. It is effectively teaching our kids that God's laws are outdated and we need to change our beliefs that will codify and promote whatever the courts say is legal. Surely we won't stop here. What's next? Pedophilia? Bestiality? Well, this may seem ludicrous to some of you. While this may seem ludicrous, it will surely be normalized tomorrow by this type of indoctrination that has normalized unthinkable behavior in a vast majority of today's graduates. Social and emotional learning should be done at home by parents that can choose to raise their kids based upon their own beliefs. It's individualism, not the collective, that will save our nation from becoming something born out of Marxist philosophy that is all the rage today. Our nation was founded on Christian principles by mostly Christian founders, and it has been slowly eroding in recent decades, but now is falling off the cliff, perpetuated in our government-run independent schools. John Wirt. President Hubert, board, Dr. Noll. I'm John Wirtz, treasurer of the Montgomery County Republican Party. Last Tuesday, as Mr. Berker pointed out to you, the local Republican Party passed a resolution that condemns the destructive teachings of racism and Marxism embedded in an ideology known as critical race theory, or CRT, which you've heard about tonight. Several years ago, C-Scope, with progressive Marxist ideology seeds, crept into our lexicon in our local public schools. Then came the scourge of Common Core, and now International Baccalaureate. I've been told that while C-Scope is supposedly no longer around, it and derivatives of Common Core, also prohibited from being taught in Texas schools, are actually taught through the back door by misguided but determined progressive teachers. You just heard some of that tonight just like the lady who got caught on audio by a brave young man or woman who recorded that and gave it to Connor Ernest, vomiting out her CRT Marxist ideology at the Woodlands High School. Apparently, this has been going on for quite some time. As a taxpayer, this disgusts me. So what are we going to do about it? What kind of discipline will you put in place to stop this cancer from spreading throughout our school district that we pay taxes to. How about we have a working plan at the next school board meeting on June 15th, I believe it is, that involves parents, PTOs. David Burke said, we have a group, education group, that'd be glad to work with y'all and other stakeholders. That would be a start. In fact, on behalf of the other officers, and members of the nine-person steering committee of the Republican Party here locally, as well as our 80-plus county executive committee, I'd like to invite you, Mr. Chairman, or you, Dr. Noll, to, for you guys to come give us a progress report at our next meeting on Tuesday, July 13th at 6.30 in the Sadler Building, also known as the Commissioner's Court. We look forward to seeing you. Uh, President Hubert, Dr. Noel, you both have my phone number. I look forward to hearing from you.
Mickey Rowland. President Hubert, thank you so much for letting me come and speak uh, to y'all this evening. And I just want to say that my husband and I both were graduates of Conroe High back in the 70s. And uh, we are parents of six uh, beautiful children and uh, grandparents to six children. So I'm here to echo the sentiments of uh, the others that have spoke against critical race theory. It, critical race theory holds that the most important thing about, your, about you is your race, the color of your skin. That is who you are. Not your character, not your behavior, not your values, not your environment, but your race. In critical race theory, if you are a member of a minoritized racial group, and that's their term, not mine, you are the victim of a system that is rigged against you, a system that does not want you to succeed. On the other hand, if your race is privileged, you are an explorer or oppressor, whether you intend to be or not. Critical race theory begins from the assumption that racism occurs in all interactions. To see how this works, consider this thought experiment. Imagine you are a teacher in the public school. Two students enter your classroom at the same time for help with an assignment, one white and one black. Who do you help first? If you help the black student first, critical race theorists would say you did so because you believe black students to be inferior intellectually to whites and therefore need more help. That is racist. If you help the white student first, critical race theorists would say you did so because you believe blacks are second class citizens. That is racist too. That is critical race theory. It can find racism in anything, even if it has to read your mind to do it. Critical race theory is an academic discipline built on the intellectual framework of identity-based Marxism and holds that racism is ingrained in the United States. CRT is not a continuation of the civil rights movement. It is, in fact, a repudiation of it. To critical race theorists, Martin Luther King was both wrong and naive, and white Americans can never judge blacks by the content of their character. They can only judge them always unfavorably, consciously or unconsciously, by the color of their skin. Is this what we want taught to our children in schools? Genuine American history is rich with stories of achievements and sacrifices that will move the hearts of Americans in stark contrast to the grim and pessimistic narrative pressed by critical race theorists. We must have courage, the fundamental virtue required in our time. Courage to stand and speak the truth. Thank you. Virginia Young. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. I don't have anything prepared, much has already been said. But I did bring this from Science Daily. I brought this abstract because it's brief. This comes out of LSU. Um, I am here because parents and grandparents and students alike have asked me to come speak before the board for probably the whole year, and this is my first opportunity. I am, however, a homeschool teacher. Uh, I had four children go through Conroe ISD. My youngest is now graduating. Um, he was on the track team as well. It was a great year. Um, the reason why I, I brought this particular new link between hypoxia and blood clot risk is because we have known, and I have a background in biomedical science, health, master's in health, and I worked in cell biology, and I performed PCR. The polymerase chain reaction is used when you don't have enough DNA to do anything. It fails. Now, I, it fails terribly. It fails all the time when I was using it, nine times out of ten. I'm sure it's probably improved, but I have yet to figure out how it is we're using a PCR test for this and why in the world we would allow a PCR test and mask wearing to our whole lives and livelihoods to revolve around this. Social emotional learning, critical race theory, and mask wearing are tools of Marxism, communism. We've known this. I know it because I had a mother who lived through the Depression. She was an older mother. She had me in her 40s. 
I, di I nearly died of a stroke myself, and yet I was told I was going to have to wear a mask. I'm thankful to say I never did it, and I never stayed inside. And when I think I had COVID, I took vitamin C. And my husband, a physician, successfully treated with hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, and so did all the others. All right? Now, what's important about this article from the physiologic perspective is this mask will come back. Stand your ground, please. I realize you're wearing it now because you feel you have to, maybe, all right, for whatever reason. But we have always known for decades in healthcare, I just have my masters, S protein is a natural anticoagulant. S protein is reduced with hypoxia. Hypoxia starts immediately within seconds. Your heart rate and your blood pressure go up. And guess what? You wear masks long enough, you take them off, it doesn't come down. As far as race is concerned, we know that blacks are a 30 to 60% increased chance of thromboembolism without the masks. And masks increase the risk of fatal thromboembolism. Thank you. Deborah Harris. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Null and President Hubert. Um, my name is Deborah Ferris. I'm a resident of Montgomery County and a CISD constituent. Thank you in advance for your time. Just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about mask mandates for children. I only have a couple of points to make. First, I want to point out that Stanford University did a study on the effects of wearing masks to prevent the spread of COVID. The study results are as follows, and I quote, Face masks are ineffective to block transmission of COVID-19 and actually can cause both health deterioration and premature death. The study was released by the National Center for Biotechnologic Information, which is a branch of the National Institute for Health. The study should have been picked up by the media and distributed, but it hasn't been because it's not the liberal narrative. Um, even the World Health Organization acknowledges that there are mask complications, including an increase in bacterial pneumonia from breathing in your own emissions, and we're doing that to our children, making them breathe in their own emissions every day that they have to wear a mask. My own great nephew had an awful rash on his face from wearing a mask every day, and my niece was very good about washing his mask so that it wasn't building up bacteria and it still happened. Um, in general, masks can only stop viruses larger than 0.3 microns. Well, COVID is a 0.1 micron in size. So the mask does not help keep out COVID. Um, I also, that's what I had to say about the mask. I also have a comment about CRT because I have a multiracial, multicultural family which side of the room do we put my half black, half white nieces and nephews on? I mean, I love my black nephew as much as I love my white niece. And I, I just refuse to have them taught that their white mother could somehow be oppressing them. It's, it, it, it doesn't need to happen. It's no place for that in the schools. We've got a lot of multiracial biracial families and children. Look around at all the couples that are black and white. Nobody cares anymore. They're digging up the past and trying to, they have an agenda. Well, it's an agenda. It's a Marxist agenda. And that's what they're trying to pass. So just please put a stop to this and please take the masks off these kids. Thank you. Leah Hewlin. Thank you for your service to this community. I know you have a very tough job. I appreciate that. Um, I'm here to speak against critical race theory. Um, imagine America, we all embrace the following statement. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the American idea the idea that made us a nation, the idea that we fought a civil war over, and the battle cry of MLK and the civil rights movement. 
but this idea is under direct assault by critical race theory. Today, even in this school district, as we've heard today, that children are being taught that America is systemically racist. It's in our DNA and embedded in every document and institution. Critical race theory is communistic, Marxist, and has no place in the United States of America. America's history isn't perfect, as of none of us are here. We had slavery and segregation, but no other nation has been founded on the idea that all people are created equal. And no other nation has fought a war to end slavery or worked harder to embrace this idea. Critical race theory is Marxism rerun. It is trying to create a class struggle between blacks and whites. It says that everything is about color and institutions must be overthrown and the system changed. Critical race theory is trying to teach our children to hate America and everything America stands for. This ideology is destructive, not only just in America, but in the state of Texas and right here in the Connor Independent School District. As the members of the school board, you can be America's hero and yes. Texas hero by getting rid of critical race theory right here in CISD schools. We can lead the nation and lead the state in this charge. <laughs> or you could continue to or you could contribute to the fall of America, the freest nation for people of any color. Don't fail the thousands who died to end slavery. Don't fail the abolitionists and civil rights activists. Don't fail the children of Texas. Don't destroy MLK's dream. Today, the words of the Declaration of Independence and the fate of MLK's dream are in your hands. Don't surrender our children to Marxism. Teach them, like MLK wanted, to judge people on the context of their character, not on the color of their skin. If Texas and this body, if we fail to get rid of critical race theory, we don't only lose Texas, but we'll lose America. But if Texas leads, and right here in Conroe, if we lead the state in this fight against this ideology, Texas could save not just America, but the idea America stands for, the idea that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with the unalienable rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Carrie Freemeyer. What a great evening this has been. So inspiring. I just want to say thank you on behalf of uh, Texas State Teachers Association as the president of the organization of the local chapter. I want to say thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for ensuring the safety of every employee as well as our students and making sure that we are safe. We've had to go through a lot. This has been a very challenging year. It's been a very challenging year for everyone. And you have made very difficult decisions. And we appreciate it. We appreciate all the support that you have backed us up on as employees of Conroe ISD, the largest district in this area. I also want to say on behalf of Christy Soboda, Vice President of TSTA Conroe and Chairman of the Teacher of the Year Salute to Education Ceremony, thank you. Thank you for working with us again to honor the CISD Teachers of the Year. We are excited that Eden Young and Teresa Stewart were chosen as our Connor ISD Teachers of the Year, Elementary and Secondary Teachers of the Year by our panel of professors from Sam Houston State University. We also want to thank the board, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Null, thank you for taking the health and safety of not only the 65,000 students in CISD, but the thousands of employees who come to work every day. These employees care for the students in their classrooms, in their cafeteria, and on their buses. Not only ensuring their safety, making certain that they go home every night and making sure that they're um, not bringing anything to their at-risk members. who might have been exposed to COVID if not for the safety measures that you had in place. So I want to say thank you. Um, it has been a pleasure this year. 
We've got five more days, you guys. Five more days. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you. Faith Sawyer. Sorry, I didn't hear. You didn't hear that? I have a dream that one day my four little children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. If y'all agree with that statement, you are a racist. This is what critical race theory teaches our children. It teaches that if you're a white person, you are an oppressor. If you're a person of color, you are inherently oppressed. Think of what that is teaching kids. It's teaching them that it's not the choices they make. It's the color of their skin that decides who they are. Think of what this is gonna have an impact on children. If you are a white student, you're gonna grow up believing that there's something wrong with you, you should feel guilty, and that there's something inside of you that you can never change, and that will always harm those around you. If you're a person of color, you're gonna grow up believing that you can never succeed in this system. You're gonna grow up believing that you should never even try to become a doctor or a lawyer because a white person will always take your place. Furthermore, you will also believe that the white students in your classroom hate you secretly and they're not treating you as they treat their white friends. In addition to that, I would like to point out that school has no business teaching children the morals of teachers. Amen. Teachers are meant to teach children history, science, math, factual things that are not ideological and controversial and political in nature. Amen. I know where my identity comes from. It comes from here. It does not come from the color of my skin. But it took me all of my childhood and many years of my adult life to learn that. So I'd like you to think, is a little child gonna know the difference? Are they gonna know that their identity is not given to them by their school board members and their teachers who are forcing an ideology on them that tells them they are guilty of something even if it's a crime that they have not committed? Think of the impact that will have on their identity. Remember when the black square was circling around on Facebook and Instagram and they said white silence is violence? Your silence is violence. If you are not actively condemning this ideology, it's not enough to sit there and do nothing and not support it. It's only enough if you come out and actively do something to stop it. Thank you. All right, that, that concludes our citizen participation. We appreciate everybody's comments and willingness to come. This is the forum to share your ideas, your thoughts with us, and we do appreciate everybody. We'd like to take a five-minute recess, please.
All right, we will continue our meeting. For those of you who would like to continue talking, perfectly fine, but please move move outside so we can get started. Hey, Skeeter, pull your microphone down to you a little more. There you go. Is that better? Yes, sir. All right. Moving on to item four, which is a consent agenda. I have not heard from anybody to remove any items. So I'm um, going to approve the agenda as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I, I just had one question, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Uh, the the monies that it looks like these are just donations to Bradley uh, for the playground equipment. Is that what it, it, we're doing there? I'm reading on budget amendment. I can pass this down to you, Mr. President, if you don't want to read it. I'm, I'm just wondering, is that what is that all that is? I think to Mr. Herman, you are correct. Okay. Those, are, those are donations. That's what I thought. I just saw it on the agenda. It was one little question I had. Yeah. Right. Thank Other you. Other than that, no questions. Very good. Any others? All right. Good question. Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Very good. Motion passes. Item four hmm. uh, receive presentation of submitted names for Conroe ISD campus and facilities all right just a reminder that sarah is going to remind us of the process but tonight's just a sharing of information not not necessarily not a discussion item for tonight just a sharing of information and we'll turn it over to miss flakelot yes, good evening president huber members of the board dr Knoll. last month i came to you and we um received an overview of the process and so tonight i'm here to share with you the names submitted through the website in total, between April 21st and May 14th, we received 765 submissions. And then I'll be back next month, and that will be when you will discuss and potentially choose the names for these campuses and facilities. I would like to let you know that there will be um, electronic copies of the full submissions on our website tomorrow, because I know we're gonna go through these kind of fast with all the names, but the full list will be online. So the first one is our new Conroe Elementary Flex 21 opening in August of 2022. And for this elementary school, we received 449 total submissions. And of course, many of them were duplicates and they've been condensed down to the list you see here. So I will give you just a second or two to look those over. And I will, I'm gonna email, I will email you all tomorrow the the full spreadsheet so we didn't print it tonight just figure why waste the paper we can send it to you electronically okay any objections if i he could mr mr Hubert. okay, okay. Oh, yeah. it looked like a great list of names mm -hmm. yeah, all of them oh. yes and the, the next um school we received submissions for was the new junior high in the caney creek feeder and it's going to open in august of 2023 and this one will be to replace the current moorhead junior high and one of the things you'll notice on here is that Warhead was one of the submitted names. And so that'll be a decision that you guys will, um, of course, discuss next month is if the name moves or stays with the facility, or if you choose something all together, that is at the board's pleasure. Okay. Drew Aron, Artwell Brown. And then we go on to <laughs> the current Moorhead Junior High, since it will be converted into an intermediate. And for this school, we received five, uh, 57 total submissions. I don't know why the alignment's off. I don't believe there's a hidden name there. But, um. right, okay. And one thing you'll notice is that um, names were submitted for, or like the same name might have been submitted for all facilities. So mm -hmm. there, there is some repetition here, which should give you some nice choice. The next facility is the Teacher Training Center, which is currently um, being constructed just north of Wood Forest Bank Stadium on that site that we have. It's scheduled to open in spring of 2022. We received 82 total submissions. These are a little bit more varied. There's some acronyms in there and um, more than people names. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows you. TLC, that's cute. I like Come on. And then the last one is the virtual school, which again, we're still waiting to hear approval from the state, but we started the planning process anyway. If approved, it'll open in August of this year. And um, this will open with grades three through nine. We received 36 total submissions. And even though it's not a brick and mortar school, it is an academic program and it will end up serving high school students. So that may, you know, we do have board policies outlining um, naming processes for the different grade levels. So course um, that again is at the board's discretion all right 
So just to remind everybody, board policy for anybody who would like to um, brush up on it is CW Local with um, where it outlines the naming rules. And we will be back again next month. Um, there will be two items, one where we'll present the names and then one where you'll discuss or you'll actually name each individual location. So we look forward to having that for you. And just to restate, you're not bound by the list. Yeah, sure. So you you yeah, we, you all are able to to make any recommendation or motion at the next meeting that you all wish be it on the list or not. So that's your, that is your But we'll do all three next we next will. Meeting. Yeah, we will name all the all of them at the next board meeting. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Moving on to item 6A, consider approval of guaranteed maximum price amendment for the Conroe High School ninth grade class edition project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the contract documents. All right, Mr. Foster. Foster. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Null. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval our guaranteed maximum price amendment for our Conroe High School ninth grade classroom edition project and then authorize Dr. Null to complete the contract documents. In February of 2020, you, our Board of Trustees, selected Ellisor Constructors to be our construction manager at risk for this project. And since then, they've worked with us and our designer, the IBI Group, to develop the scope of work for this project. Based on that effort, we present a guaranteed maximum price of $9,397,179.19 for your approval. This time, that is what we ask. So moved. We have a motion. I second the motion. And we have a second. Any discussion? I have a question. Yes, sir. In the in the scope of work, how much addition additional classrooms are going to be available? So there's there's ten additional classroom spaces. Two okay. of those being computer labs and eight conventional classrooms. I, I'm sorry. Two, two computer labs and eight conventional classrooms. Okay. Okay. Is that similar to the addition we did at uh, Irons Junior High a while back, where we kind of added on to the end of the building and we no yes well i mean uh each site is unique this is a single story addition uh and it's dealing with, a, with some topography that i, I was going to say the right. cost seemed different but i know the slope back there is is fairly significant correct and and, and irons was also several years ago absolutely so we've yeah. experienced yeah. Some, some significant <laughs> yeah. construction inflation yeah. over the last several okay years. Now, but that being said this project came in underneath our budget target mm -hmm. that we'd set as part of the bond referendum process. Okay. So we feel like we, we accomplished our goals. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Hearing none, I'll call the vote. All those, all those, or you have a question? Or no, no. All those in favor? Raise your hand. Any opposed? Agreement. Very good. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Moving on to item B or 6B, received capital improvement updates. Pictures. Okay. Foster. Pictures. All right. At this time, I'd like to give you an update on our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. I'm going to start with Hope Elementary. So I'm happy to report this will probably be the last time you and I get to speak about <laughs> Hope Elementary because we did uh, some fire marshal walks earlier this month. We got our temporary certificates of occupancy. Uh, we will have the permanent certificates of occupancy by the end of this month, and then next month we'll take possession of it as the district, uh, and it'll be ready for uh, the principal, Mr. Lozano, to staff it and set up furniture and do everything it is to uh, create a new elementary school. So it is scheduled to open in August uh, when the students return from their summer break, and it is on schedule. Inside that building, you're seeing just exactly what I'm telling you. This is the library ready to receive its library books and other library items. Uh, the gym is coming together. I mean, you see it taped for the striping. Uh, that striping is finished at this point. And then on the classrooms, they're also uh, likewise ready to receive their furniture. So that project again is on schedule and will open in August of 2021. Moving on to York Junior High School, which is an addition. So we're increasing the overall capacity at York Junior High. Uh, and you can see from the overhead picture that the exterior of the building is essentially complete at this point. So the, the focus uh, for us now, as students exit for the summer break is to break through the walls where the, the fine arts additions are happen, where the athletics additions happen. So we're working that process now. And as soon as the students leave, we'll be breaking into those and expanding those spaces. Inside, you can see the new circulation pathways around the outside of the building come together. You can see the classrooms coming together. It is scheduled to turn over for our use in August of 2021. That'll be when the students return from the, this coming summer break. It is on schedule. Mr. Foster, can you yes. go back to that first 
So there's, is that kind of an open area in the middle there? Court, courtyard. Courtyard. Correct. That is an, an open courtyard right off the dining commons. So uh -huh. it's an extended lunch space so the students can go outside and eat lunch if, gotcha. if necessary okay. or if possible. Thank uh, you. Weather permitting. So probably not tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry. Open drains. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, we have a lot of questions about the right. draining. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we'll find out if it drains in the morning. So. Yeah. Uh, the Woodlands College Park High School additions. This is an, a project that's, uh, to allow us to decrease our reliance on portable buildings. Right. And just like York, you can see that uh, the exterior is essentially complete. They're working on the canopies and the bus ramp uh, so that we can work with our transportation department and get them situated on how the buses come in and out of the back of that campus for next school year. It is also on schedule. It's scheduled to open in August uh, when the students return from their summer break. On the inside, you can see the classrooms come together. Uh, carpets going in now. And this pro project also recarpets a lot of College Park High School. Mm -hmm. That process will start in earnest when the students leave for their summer break uh, in, at the end of next week. At the Woodlands High School, there's another building addition that'll help us reduce our reliance on portables. Again, just like the other two, it is essentially complete on the exterior. Uh, on the inside of that building, uh, the classrooms are coming together. This building has some specialty classrooms, some AV, some robotics, some other science-related classrooms that uh, the other two uh, don't have so much of. Uh, those are coming together, as you can see there. They're loading them up with equipment and starting to get the finishes and everything in them. Uh, we will accept it and turn it over for use for the students in August and it is also on schedule. Just a quick question. Yes. <clears throat> the um, College Park and Woodlands High School, you mentioned to reduce the reliance on portables. And can you just remind me how much we're reducing it by? There'll still be portables at both of those high schools? Or? Well, I, I can tell you, I don't control where portables go or where they land, but we're adding enough classrooms to accommodate the portables that were currently on the site when we got there for yeah. construction. Uh, but you know with growth and growth is a is a wave it comes and goes uh, but I believe uh, we're moving most all the portables off that site so it says all the portables at College Park are leaving this year and then most of the portables at the Woodlands M most so, some of the some, some. of the portables. <laughs> okay well, there's a couple things I want to mention on portables one so the move will cost money and it's okay. don't need them somewhere Right. Some will also be utilized for things like storage, mm -hmm. or if you if we do put a teacher out there, maybe a teacher that let's say like a, uh, a a coach or somebody that teaches a reduced number of sections, so they only teach like one class period. So you put them in that portable rather than take up a, a place in the building where they would that in that classroom would sit empty for the half the day um, you put them out there for their one period so you, you still will have many less students going outside of the building than we have this year okay thank you i'm glad i could answer that so thoroughly <laughs> <laughs> So moving on to our campus renovation projects, this is our project that we do annually that helps us replace things that are reach the end of their service life or need major modifications. So we've been working at Armstrong Elementary. The main scope here is to increase the serving line capacity in the kitchen and create a more efficient and uh, functional kitchen operation uh, for that building. It was built as a circle. And you can imagine the exterior parts of the circle are difficult to get mm -hmm. the perfect dimensions on. Um, in order to do that, we're adding some classroom space there. So you can see the structure for the classroom, the masonry is, showed, is showing up. So you can see the brick wall, the block wall on the back of the picture going up. Uh, the next piece would be the roof deck uh, and then drying that particular structure in. It's not very large, so it is on schedule. Uh, and then when students leave at the end of next week, we'll be breaking through the walls into the existing spaces and starting the renovation of the kitchen and the serving line area. Uh, and that project is on schedule. Uh, another portion of our campus renovations project is the turf replacement, which is a life cycle, normal life cycle uh, replacement of the turf at uh, Moorhead Stadium. So we did it a little early in the year so that we could help facilitate summer programs at Conroe High School while that other big project is going on. And you can see that turf was actually turned over for the students to use this coming Monday. Uh, so it is complete uh, and that they are using it uh, as we speak or when it's not raining. Looks real nice. It's very pretty. Nice. Yeah. It's very nice. So as we as we move forward, uh, 
in the next month you'll see pictures of ride elementary which is our next major scope of work so next month you'll get to see the pictures of the demolition process for ride as we replace uh, the air conditioning systems and the systems that happen above the ceiling in that campus uh, that that project has been doing some overnight work uh, getting ready for that uh, it will start in earnest next month the entire campus renovations project is on schedule uh, and everything is uh, procured and pre-ordered and should be on site as planned and we anticipate that going off without too many issues Moving on to Creighton Elementary, which is a, a, a more intense overhaul of Creighton Elementary than we would typically do in a single summer. Uh, it is one of the last campuses we have to add a fire sprinkler to. It's not the last one, but it is one of the last. Uh, but out on that campus, it required a, a significant upgrade to the well and the, the uh, water storage on site to, to function that, to allow that fire sprinkler system to function. That tank is an extremely long lead item product. It is ordered the foundations are in, but it won't arrive for several more months. Uh, you're seeing here the, uh, the pump house expansion for the things that go along with that tank, the underground utilities for it. Uh, we've been working on the roof on that building. Uh, so we are about 95% with the roof membrane, uh, as the, the waterproofing membrane. The next step would be to finish that little rock section there in the middle uh, and then put the white cap sheet on it, which will happen in the first part of the summer. Uh, then on the inside, much like we're doing a ride, we're gonna st start tackling the overhaul of all the systems inside that building. So next month you'll see the demolition pictures and then in July you'll see it going back together. Uh, we will put it back together for school in August, but we will be on that campus for another summer. The work will ramp down in August when school starts again and then we'll crank it back up uh, during the breaks in the next summer and complete that project in August of 22. The new junior high school in the Caney Creek High School feeder zone is on schedule. It's scheduled to open in August of 2023. Uh, the focus on this site and many of our sites is concrete, which weeks like we have this week make it difficult. Uh, but they're, they're getting as much concrete on the ground as they can. So you're seeing the, uh, the blue areas are the next sections of the building slabs that are being poured. Uh, the paving, as you can see it growing around the building, will also help us uh, eliminate the or not eliminate but mitigate the areas of, of that are affected by rain so the more concrete we get on the round the more effectively we can work through the wetter seasons of the year again that project is on schedule and is scheduled to open in august of 2023 now our connor high school this is our master plan project where we're going to reorganize just about every building on that campus uh, the focus here is getting ready for the cte edition uh, in this picture so i've been showing you pictures of the ground coming up this is one of those areas where we're taking care of some elevation change on the site. Uh, they're preparing the building pad for that CTE addition, that which wraps around the existing band hall. And then we're starting to work with the campus as we look at the long schedule of that project and, and make a solid plan for what programs go where during what time during construction so that we can maintain that schedule. We will be on this campus through 2025. So it is a, a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, but there are several things that we're going to be turning over uh, and immediately the first phase of that is the CT and a little bit of an athletic improvement and then we'll start running through the rest of that campus. Mr. Foster, on yes, that sir. picture, can you just remind me how much of the rotunda and the annex that we see there, how much of that, is that all being repurposed or is some of that going away once a new so, CTA um, CT is in place? At the conclusion of this project, the rotunda, the annex, and the, the bottom building, which is in the, the bottom part of that picture, all three of those are removed from service completely. That's what I thought. Okay. Uh, so you're seeing in those areas where the rotunda is currently sitting will be the largest parking lot for the band practice area uh, and then the, you'll be looking at the fine arts additions and everything's that right are off of that uh, again the the one purpose there was to help mitigate uh, elevation change across that site and to put the entire campus under one mm -hmm. roof right. so when we are done it will be one contiguous building from start or from left to right top to bottom thank you now our teaching training center which is at wood forest bank stadium uh, again focuses on concrete here uh, the uh, the steel is about to arrive, so that building is beginning to go vertical uh, in the next week or so. Uh, you can see the paving around that. A lot of us were on that site last week for the Education Foundation breakfast. Uh, so the focus since then has been working on the underground electrical in the building slab because it is a uh, place where lots of people are housed, lots of desks, lots of need for power, and lots of need for uh, uh, technology be to individual locations. So that project is on schedule, and we'll be on that site for about a year so we'll finish it in the spring semester of 2022 so we'll be there uh, turn it over at the end of january and then uh, work on how to outfit it and, and begin using it in the spring semester 
our safety and security um, project. Yes. Real quick, uh, can you go back to the picture uh, before? We um, that scoreboard will be moved. Yes. Or it will stay there. Okay. Now the scoreboard is moving to the south end of, of the stadium, so that work actually begins this week, uh, uh, weather permitting. Uh, but the, the process of moving that scoreboard, the steel for that arrives uh, tomorrow, uh, and then they're going to roll the turf back on the south end zone. They're going to make some adjustments to the locker room on the on the far end of the building, uh, on the far end of the, the field anyway, and then they'll begin begin erecting the new structure for the scoreboard on the other end uh, over the over the summer. So the goal there is to get it ready. Uh, and in function uh, for the football season uh, in August. Okay. My understanding is the bump out that's there at the natatorium where the, the locker room or that's going to kind of be taken off, right? Yeah, so for in, and then that's where the scoreboard will go above that. Correct. And in a very simple term, we're taking the bump outs. You can see that's right behind the goalpost right. away yeah. and creating an inset there that the scoreboard will sit in. That's so going to be helpful to the players on the field too, having to run through that end zone. There's not a lot of room back there. Correct. I mean, that, so that'll that, create a little more distance. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And it's it's not affecting any of the locker room space itself. So right. we're able to use that covered porch area for the school board location. Okay. Great. Moving on to our safety and security project. This is a district wide effort. So we're going to talk about the 2021 installment, which is generally speaking in the Oak Ridge area of the district. So we're looking at a picture inside of Kaufman Elementary. Uh, again, most of this work you can't physically see. So a lot of it's just fortifying the uh, front entry, doing, putting some impact resistant glass on or films on the glass vestibules, uh, doing some security uh, monitors so that the front office can see and monitor how the doors are activated uh, throughout the building throughout the day. And then camera upgrades and server upgrades and things that are above the ceiling. That work is taking place on overnights and weekends currently. Uh, it is on schedule. We will wrap up this portion of it uh, in August. And then we, we've already started this summer. We'll walk the next phase of that campus. So we'll bring you for approval uh, later this year, the uh, 2022 edition. For, and then we'll work on as we work throughout the entire district with that, with that project. So it is currently on schedule uh, and doing exactly what we anticipated it doing. Moving on to Flex 21, that's our new elementary school in the Conroe High School feeder zone. Uh, just like our other major projects, uh, concrete is our focus. Uh, since this picture was taken, we have poured that first section of building slab, which is that uh, yellow piece on the right hand side of the screen. And you can see the stabilized subgrade for the driveways and parking lots that are they're coming together on the left part of our uh, job site. That project is on schedule uh, and it is scheduled to open in August of 2022. Moving on to Oak Ridge High School, that's our overall project there, and then our South County CTE project. Uh, we brought it for your approval last month, so this since then we've set up the job site trailer, done a lot of administrative tasks, getting ready for the summer break. So when the, when the students leave for the summer break, we will start in earnest in that campus. Uh, the major scope that starts the whole project is moving the admin to the new side of the building, uh, which is essentially a rendering of what we're looking at here. So we're creating that new main street down the middle of Oak Ridge High School to help make it a more manageable, more accessible campus. Uh, and then we're, while we're doing that, we're also uh, increasing the uh, efficiency of the air conditioning system by replacing the chillers that have been installed over the years, putting in a central plant and a central air conditioning uh, and heating system. Uh, and as well, we're also gonna build a road around the campus and do a lot of other safety improvements while we're there. But the proje project is just approved, but it is currently on schedule. Uh, and we will be there for approximately 30 months. Uh, so we'll, we'll intend to be there and then uh, make some significant improvements to Oak Ridge High School. And that is our update. Well, thank you. A lot of exciting stuff going on. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Thank you. Uh, item 7A, consider award of RFP 21-04-1 bank Depository services. Right. Mr. No. Mr. Mr. President, can I be recognized first on this item? Yes, sir. I just want to uh, make it known that I have a conflict of interest as this is my employer that we're talking about. So I will neither participate in the discussion uh, and I will abstain from the vote. Very good. Thank you. And I, I will be abstaining as well as in the conversation. I'm happy to move the, the topic along, but I will be withholding any comment or, or vote on this. We'll be abstaining as well. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Null. Tonight we are requesting that the board considers awarding RFP number 21-04-01, Bank Depository Services to Wood Forest National Bank. 
as required by the Texas Education Code, subchapter G of chapter 45, Request for proposals pertaining to the purchase of bank depository services for the district were mailed a package via the U.S. Post Office to all 30 banks located within the district and emailed through the electronic CIST e-bidding system, as well as advertised two times in the courier. Four vendors submitted a proposal. This proposal is for an initial two-year term with the option to extend for three additional two-year terms for a possible total of eight years as allowed by law. The period of award will begin on September 1st, 2021. The proposals were evaluated by our finance department and reviewed by the purchasing department. Best value is recommended for board award as noted on the attached analysis. Funds for these pr purchases are provided in the general fund and at this time we recommend your approval. I move approval of RFP 210401 to Wood Forest National Bank. Second. second. Right. We have a motion and a second. We have any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? And any abstentions? Very good. Motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Reeves. And on to item B of seven, which is receive financial report. Ms. Garza. Ms. Garza. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Nall. It is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements for the month ended April 30th, 2021. First statement is our balance sheet presented here is the general fund, the debt service fund, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. Total assets in the general fund, 371.4 million. In debt service, 49.6 million. In child nutrition, 5.6 million. And in self-funded insurance, 11 million. Next statement is our income statement. The income statement shows the district's revenues and expenditures. Total revenue in the general fund year to date is 523.5 million, total expenditures of 330 million. Taking a closer look at our local revenue, our largest generator of course in the general fund and debt service is property taxes in child nutrition, food sales, and food sales are down dramatically this year as a result of all students eating free. However, we have seen an increase on the federal side because of the meal reimbursement for the free breakfast and lunch. Self-funded insurance, our largest revenue generator is premium contributions in the amount of 37.1 million. Tax collections are coming in nicely. We are actually slightly above where we were at this time last year, just 0.02% ahead, so we are pleased with that. Self-funded insurance, our year-to-date revenue is at 35.6 million. Year-to-date expense is at 34.6. We are sitting at a a net gain of one, just over one million for the year, so we are in a good place. However, we are ramping up for the summer months, which typically is a lot more active in the health plan, so um, we are gearing up for that. Our participation at the wellness centers in April was 377, averaging 333 for the year. Ms. Garza, can I ask a question about the self-funded insurance plan? I know that we hired Gallagher, and was Gallagher supposed to go back and look at some maybe some refunds or something it, am, am i just crazy i don't you know it seemed like there was something that they were going to go back and do to try to help us yeah, i know they're, they're actually looking at um the contract that we have okay on our pharmacy side yes at rebates. that's what i'm talking about we sorry have, uh, contracted uh, with a company outside of um united healthcare to actually help us with the pbm practice okay and, and get us additional rebates in Okay, okay. We have any idea when we anticipate and any estimate on how much? Um, and I assume all that would go back right back into the self funded plan. Yes, sir. It, yeah. It, it is reflected in the savings that we had in our, in, our, in our plan. If you remember, we were looking at a 9% increase. Yes. And we got that down to yes. Four increase. Yes. Those reductions and, or the increases in rebates. Right. Are, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I think it was about $2.4 million, but okay. I can get that number for you. Well, what, what I'm mostly interested in, I, I, it, it, that was an estimate, yes. right? So when will we be able to compare that estimate to the actual, I mean, next year. It, okay. At the, at the conclusion of the year. We'll at the say. conclusion of next year. Yes. Okay. Because yes, what I'm trying to think through is, I mean, that reduced the amount of increase in premiums that everyone that's in the plan had to pay. Yes. That's good, but... If the if the amount we get back is more, would that have reduced it further? That's that's my thought or my question that I'm trying to figure out. 
I understand the lag that you're talking about because we have to get through the financial year, so I get that as well. It reduces it in the future, though, because it would go so into I that guess, fund balance. I guess yes, that's sir. what would happen. It yeah, goes back into the fund future. balance, and then next mm -hmm. year when we have yes. that discussion, yes, I got it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. All right, and lastly, our investments as of April 30th, our par value is at 695.4 million. The pools are yielding 0.113. Our investments with TCG, which is our longer term investments, have a WAM of 457 days yielding at 1.15. And our combined portfolio is yielding 0.196 with a WAM of 36 days, compared to our benchmark, which is the 90 day T bill at 0.015. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garza. Great. All right. This meeting of the Conroe ISD Board of Trustees is convened on May 18th, 2021. Quorum of the board is present, including the following members, Mr. Hubert, Mr. Moore, Mrs. Wagaman, Mr. Sanders, Mrs. Chase, Mr. Williams, and Mr. Inman. The board will hear the complaint appeals of parent James Hollingsworth in accordance with local board policy FNG. The hearing is being recorded. Mr. Hollingsworth complaints are against various staff members at the Woodlands High School, district level administration, and the level one and level two hearing officers. Because the complaints are against district employees and because person personally identifiable information about a public school student could be revealed, the hearing will be held in closed session pursuant to Texas government code section 551.074 and 551.0821. The board will also go into executive session under Texas government code section 551.071 for consultation with the board's attorney. This meeting is adjourned to executive session under Texas Government Code sections 551.071, 551.074, and 551.0821. Everyone not associated with this hearing should leave the room. The board will take no action while in executive session. The time is now 8.45. The board is now in open session at 11.34 p.m. The next agenda item is item, what is it, 10, 10 a. a? Yes, sir. Okay, Dr. No, let's consider purchase of approximate 16 acre site in the Caney Creek High School for <coughs> zone. Mrs. Gladys. Thank you, Dr. Noll. This is, uh, we've been discussing, you know, purchasing a school site in the Caney Creek Speeder Zone. Um, we're in the process of purchasing one of those and this item asks for your approval to go ahead and authorize Dr. Null to negotiate that transaction um, and uh, effectuate it once the, the details are worked out. The parts is there is 293 a square foot. It's about 16 acres. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you very much. Item B, consider purchase of approximately 18 acre site in the Caney Creek High School feeder zone. Dr. Noll. All right, Ms. Gladys. This is the same thing, just a different feeder zone and a slightly bigger piece of property for a little teeny bit more money. So we will give Dr. Noll the permission again to finish negotiating that and effectuate the purpose. It would be appreciated. I move we approve as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion to adjourn. All right. Motion do we, to adjourn. Do we need to go over consider level three hearing? Is no, that, it's already. That's motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Excuse me. There we go. All right, we're done. Motion doesn't.